Hello and welcome to Unheard. Catherine Burblesing is the founder and headmistress of the Michaela Community School in London. Since opening in 2014, Michaela School has become a bit of a lightning rod for the culture war around education. Catherine has set aside the softly softly approach of modern teaching for a more no tolerance code of behaviour. And it turns out the quote, strictest school in Britain seems to work. Michaela is rated as an outstanding school and rivals the top ranking private schools in England in its exam results. But this week it was announced that Catherine would have to defend her school's ethos at the High Court. What happened is this. One of Catherine's policies to put students on equal footing was to ban prayer at school. A Muslim pupil at Michaela has claimed that the ban is discriminatory. It's gone all the way to the High Court and it is causing a big stir. It is raising questions about multiculturalism, secular life, education and much else. And I'm delighted to say that the famous headmistress is here in the studio to tell us about it. Hi. Hi. So let's start at the beginning. What is the ethos of Michaela School and how is it different from normal state schools? So we're considered to be the strictest school in Britain. <laughs> and, uh, and the reason for that is that, um, for instance, we have silent corridors. The children say good morning and good afternoon to their teachers who are all dotted around the place when they're walking around. Um, but they don't talk to each other. And they walk in single file. They um, line up in the mornings. Uh, they line up at lunchtime. And then they come into the school in single file, always looking to the front. Some people don't like this. So it sounds to... A normal person listening, it might sound a bit kind of Victorian. Uh, how would you respond to that? So uh, single file? Well, I don't know. Are they, are they smiling they, as they're walking single file down well, the corridor? People, Is that allowed? Yeah, what people always say when they come, and we get 800 visitors a year, um, mainly teachers from across the world, uh, they always say, gosh, the place is so warm, the children are so friendly, they're so happy. I would argue that our children are often, people say that they're much happier than the children at their schools. You know, like, it's... um. I think that people misunderstand order and structure and discipline. They imagine that that makes children unhappy, but actually chaos makes children unhappy. And when they know the rules, um, then they know that they can uh, have fun at certain times and then they're quiet at certain times. And there's the regulation and the structure gives them safety and a predictability that they uh, understand. That means they're really clear on the rules. And it means that... Um, I mean, are, is there playtime? Yes, there is. But even during the playtime, teachers are out there talking with them, making sure that uh, there's no bullying going on, making sure that different groups are mixing. And that's one of the things that's come up in this conversation around prayer, which is that um, in a multicultural and multi-faith environment, I think that the adults in charge need to go out of their way to uh, develop social cohesion amongst the children and to encourage different groups to mix. Because otherwise, uh, people tend to just stick with their own. And then you end up with schools where you've got the Hindu kids there and the Muslim kids there and the, you know, the, the black Caribbean kids there and the black African kids there and so on. And um, those kinds of divisions aren't helpful. Not if you want um, a multicultural society to succeed. Mm. And I know there's been discussions before, politicians and so on, talking about multiculturalism not succeeding. And I can understand why people might say that, because in some respects it does fail. But when it does fail, I would say it's because we've just let things run, as opposed to encouraging environments where people can mix and be friendly to each other and uh, have friends across that racial and, and religious divide. There's a lot to get into there, but just to um, finalise the, the introduction, as it were, about the school, it's important people understand it's in a relatively poor part of London. Yep. It's a it's a non-fee-paying school. It's not, yep. a, it's not like a fancy private school no. with all of these kids walking single file. It's no, people it's a, attending it's a, for free. It's a standard inner city school, you know, and with a very intake, diverse, very diverse kids. intake. You know, a, a sort of standard intake that you might find in the inner city that's given to us by the local council. You know, we don't choose our kids. What is that mix? Oh, gosh. I, <laughs> I mean, you've got everything. <laughs> the kids are from, you know, their, their families are, are from everywhere. I mean, whether that's uh, Somali kids or 
Indian kids or um, Nigerian background kids, uh, Ghanaian, uh, Jamaican. Um, is it mostly immigrant background kids? Yes, 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 yes. They're ethnic minorities on the whole. Uh, you know, you have some Eastern Europeans as well. But yeah, they, they tend to be mainly ethnic minority from a whole range of places, Pakistan, uh, Middle East. You know, I also didn't mention. In terms of, you know, income scale, are there lots of kids on free school meals? Is it a poor? Yeah, so it's group? about a quarter on people premium, and then and then there's lots that are just very you know ordinary families um, that um, you know just live in the inner city and have ordinary jobs and so on. Yeah, I mean we are a, a typical inner city school, and I suppose what is fascinating about us is partly our results. So uh, we've achieved last year the highest progress eight in the whole country it's ever been achieved. What does that mean? So Improvement progress, from that's the it. previous So when the position. children uh, arrive in year seven, uh, all schools in uh, England are tracked till when they leave in year 11 to see how they do. And um, I mean, look, the, the measure isn't uh, perfect, but it gives you a sense of what, what the school has contributed to the children. And uh, for the last two years, we've had the highest progress eight in the country. Out of how many schools? Thousands. Uh, thousands, yeah, three thousand, three and a half thousand, whatever it is, secondary schools. That so are. presumably a lot of the parents are happy with what's going oh, yeah. on in the school. Otherwise, there would be more complaints. Or ha- yeah. What's your experience of the parents' reaction generally? Yeah, no, 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 no. the parents are very happy. Um, I often, you know, we, we don't necessarily hear from some parents because they're happy with the school, go, you know, and the way things are going. They tend to say things like, gosh, now that they've started at Michaela, my child is better behaved at home. My child suddenly thanks me for for doing the washing up. My child suddenly is offering to do the the washing up. And that's because we spend a lot of time um, developing the children in terms of their character and who they are as people. And while we get these amazing results, uh, I always say that the thing I'm most proud of is who they are. Um, And what these 800 guests say is, you know, how come the children are so nice? What have you done with these kids? You know, I have a a friend who works in one of the uh, local state schools and he came once to visit and he came bursting into my office and he said, Catherine, I've been been asking these kids where they go to primary school. They all go to the same primary schools as our kids. What have you done to them? You know, (laughs) like he just, like, what have you done? He just couldn't understand how they were the same kids that that are at his school. And what is the answer to that question? You think it's a question of manners or boundaries? Well, it's a complicated one, but... It's about um, the the discipline, the habits that we instill in them over time, uh, the quality of the teaching and the quality of the teachers, because uh, they we have an excellent staff body, and then we're really committed and just love the children. People don't think discipline is bad, but when it's done in love, the children understand it and they appreciate it. But then it's also our small c conservative values. So that's key. I know that sometimes people will try and recreate what we do and find it's more difficult because they haven't got that special ingredient, which is the small c conservative values. And teaching the children. What does that mean? So personal responsibility. I'm responsible for getting my homework in. No matter what, I'm going to get a detention if I don't get it in. And nobody's going to allow me an excuse to say, it's all right. You come from a poorer background. It's all right. You've got special needs. It's all right. You're a black kid from an estate. We, we don't say that. We say you've got to get your homework in. So personal responsibility, uh, duty, a sense of duty towards other people, uh, towards the team. We're always talking about the team. You've got your form group, you've got your year group, and you've got Michaela the school. And we are all under the umbrella of being British. And we sing God Save the King. We sing Jerusalem. We sing... Uh, when do you sing God Save the King? When it was my, my assembly, and before they stand for me, they sing God Save the King, and then I walk in. So we're, we're very traditional in that sense. But there's, there's reason behind it. So we're not just doing that because, well, people have sung God Save the King in the past, so that's what we should do. Um, and I think, you know, sometimes that's what conservatives say, and they don't really think about the meaning behind it. The reason why we do it is because in such a multicultural environment, we need something to bind us all together. And the thing that binds us together is being British. If there's just free reign for everybody to just do whatever they want and to just create these enclaves where each each group is just on their own, that is divisive. And I don't, I think that schools should uh, help to socialize children in a way so that we can all get on. Because as a country, we will never succeed 
if we are all fighting with each other. And if in the end, it's these are my people and those are your people and don't you mess with my people and so on. We need to be able to be friends with each other across religious and racial divides. And you know about this idea of mixing quite personally because you've got quite an interesting mix of heritage yourself. Yes, indeed. Just tell us what that is. Indeed. So, well, uh, my father is uh, of Indian heritage Guyanese from Guyana um, in South America. Um, his mother was Muslim. His father was Hindu. Um, my mother is Jamaican. And my mother, well, essentially descends from, you know, uh, the, the slaves and the sla where the slave owners sadly, you know, would rape the slaves. I mean, that is, that is my mother's background. So, and my mother is then with my father, which is very rare. Um, you know, well, a black is your woman. Is mother Christian? My mother is Christian. My father is Christian. Uh, my, but, 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 uh, but an Indian man with a black woman that you don't see so much, you know? So, um, yes, I am, odd in that sense, you know, <laughs> and, and I'm certainly not against the idea of diversity, but I'm very much aware of what is required. To overcome the differences. To, to overcome those differences. And it requires uh, being friendly with each other and sacrifice. So one of the things that we teach the children about is sacrifice for the sake of the whole. I mean, let's just take a form group. Um, if somebody gets a detention, you haven't just let yourself down, you've let the whole team down. You know, and the form tutor at the end of the day, so and so's got a detention, so and so's got a detention, you know, um, 9A, I'm really, really unhappy with you. I'm unhappy with all of you. You know, it's not how could we be letting ourselves down like this, even though there's only two kids who who have got that detention, for instance. There's a sense of responsibility for the others around you and being part of the team. Um, when you know the English football team go out to play. And one of them does an own goal or does something stupid. Not an own goal, because that would be something, oh, oh gosh, he's made a mistake. As opposed to, he, he's done something bad, exactly. There's a sense of, I've let my team down. And there's shame that's involved in that. Um, and the shame comes not just from letting yourself down, but from letting your friends down. And so that we uh, very much encourage. And there is very much a sense of that within the form groups, within the year group. And they're competing with each other. You know, head of year eight will be saying, don't let those year nines out compete us and so on. Now, that is also the case across the religious groups and across the racial, the racial groups. Because, so for instance, uh, when we first started in 2014, we opened in 2014 as a new free school. Um, we uh, started eating with meat as, as any school would do. And the thing is, we have a special family lunch because we're all part of a team. We're all part of a family. And the family lunch isn't a normal canteen where people, as an individual, take your tray, go in and get your food, and then sit down, eat your food, and then leave your plate because you think, oh, the cleaners will get it, you know? We have a very different system where the children sit down and break bread together. So they, each one has a role, and there's six of them around the table. One of them goes to get the food, and brings the pot of food, and serves it out with another one bringing the plates to put the food on. And one of them sets out the cutlery, and they pour the water, and so on. And then at the end, one of them cleans up with a cloth. And they all have these roles to share family dinner like you would do at home with your family. And this, of course, teaches those children who perhaps don't have the luck of being at home with their families in the evenings because perhaps mom is working a couple of jobs or whatever it is, you don't have family dinner, they have it with us. We all started by eating meat. Some children eat meat but no pork. Some children eat meat but no beef. This is a religious divide. You know, you've got the Muslims, you've got the Hindus, you've got children who don't eat meat at all. And then we, we laid them out accordingly. But then I looked at the at the lunch hall and I saw that everyone was divided according to race and religion. It was awful. <laughs> and I thought, we can't divide the children up like this. So we changed and we became vegetarian. So we are a vegetarian school <laughs> for practical reasons. Um, as I always explain to the parents, of course you can eat meat at home, <laughs> but when the children come here, we eat vegetarian because we want everyone to be able to sit next to somebody of a different faith or different religion or different race, etc. And so we've been doing that ever since. And that is massively important. And I think, to be honest, should be important to everyone in all schools. But, you know, other schools are, are more, um, are not as strict as we are. They also don't have our building. So, yes, as you say, it comes into the case here. 
Yeah, so, yeah. so this principle of uh, school being a secular environment, uh, a place where oh. people of different faiths mix without reference to their faith, mm -hmm. that is obviously important to you. And that is what is being challenged by this case. So tell us, what is the court case? Who's bringing it and on what grounds? Well, there's a child who's bringing it. But a child can't be bringing it. I mean, who's actually bringing it? Well, I mean, her, her mum, I suppose. Do we know who's funding the project? I believe it's a, a, a legal aid situation, but um, I can't be certain of that, but I believe so. So the government ultimately? Yeah, I suppose so. We've never had a prayer room, and we've never had a prayer room because the building is such that, um, uh, well, first of all, half our kids are Muslim. So a prayer room wouldn't do. You're looking at over 300 children, right? So you need, to have, you need to have several rooms. Well, we, well, where do you get these several rooms from? We only have enough rooms for the classrooms. So you would have to then allow them into the classrooms with all the desks. I mean, suggestions have been made that, you know, the desks can be moved by the children. Well, I mean, this is the strictest school in Britain. Our ethos is such that they don't go down the corridors without being watched by, by, by their teachers and, you know, everything's in silence. If it's the case that after lunch, the non-Muslim kids are sent outside and the Muslim kids are all sent upstairs to run around the corridors to go into random classrooms to pray, well, it would mean total chaos. So I would never divide the children according to race and religion. It's just not something that so I'm willing to do. So that's the underlying objection. The yeah. more principled one, I guess, apart from the practical objections, is that you just don't want the segregation. You don't want the division. Yeah. So is it that simply you've never had a prayer room or you're actually not allowing prayer? So that's a good question. So we didn't have a prayer room and everybody who comes to the school knows this. We're very clear with all the families. And, you know, when we first opened, we had um, about 30% of our children uh, who were Muslim. We have grown that to 50% of our intake being Muslim. So, and we've done that all the while without a prayer room. So <laughs> that means the Muslim families have been very happy. And of course, the, the other Muslim families have heard of us and have thought, well, we're going to come here. Now, so do that's they not get to, to say... choose what school their kids go to? Or do they well, just... families can apply to six schools. I mean, this is the case, you know, across the country, uh, five or six schools, depending on the borough. And then the borough tries to give you your first choice school. So if they thought, oh, well, we don't want to go, well, they so didn't have an, to put it's us It's an down. indication of preference, yes. at least. Well, and if they didn't want to come, like if they give you, if the council gives you a school you don't want to go to, you can you can reject it, you know. So, and there are lots of families so who say So they're voting with their feet uh, yes. to some extent. Yes. So lots of families will say, we would like, we wish you had one, but, you know, it, you don't have a prayer room. It's okay because we love the school in all these other ways. And that's, that's more important to us in the end, you know. So it, it's sort of up to the families. So no prayer room, but is prayer allowed? Yes. So what we always said before was that you could pray in the yard because we can't make it happen in the classrooms because of physical reasons and um, also not wanting to divide the children according to race and religion. But if you were to pray in the yard, be fine. Um, for eight years, nobody ever prayed. Um, you never saw a single child praying? No, I personally have never seen a single child pray. And so last year... Uh, for whatever reason, I don't know, a few of the children decided to pray. And this then spun into something huge, which ended up with um, there being a petition online. Uh, you know, the thing is, people can see through the gates outside. So what happened? So they were, you know, they're outside in the yard. Were, were then, you know, kneeling on a, on a rug so they're just on, facing east? And they're just, they're just on... Um, on the ground, you know, so that's not particularly nice. But and in any... rows? I mean, is that ha is it a kind of organized? No, 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 no. Nothing was organized because this was only a few days that this happened. But in those few days, a petition was started, a campaign of hatred was started against us, campaigning against us, saying that we obviously hate Islam, etc., etc. on what grounds? Because more people were praying than before. No, but people who see this online or see this from outside, they don't know. They just see kids outside praying. So then they're saying, why won't you let them pray inside? You know? And they don't know why. They don't know about the building. They don't know about dividing children according to race and religion. They don't know any of those details. So how many children were praying at the peak? Remember, it's only a few days, but every day more and more were praying. So maybe about 30 or so. But that was growing every day. You know, it was constantly growing. Why do you think started. that was? Do you think that is just a normal kind of trends and what's cool and fun and interesting Partly. for kids? Or are they being asked by their parents to join? What's Partly. your sense? But what we also saw was that so it was during Ramadan. So during Ramadan, some of the children fast, and um, uh, and that's fine. 
Some of the Muslim ch children choose not to fast, and that's also fine. Uh, some of the children are weaker or smaller, or a girl is on her period, or any number of reasons, they decide that they're not going to fast. And then what ended up happening with the whole prayer situation is that our lovely school turned into one that was really quite horrible, um, where some of the more committed Muslims, as it were, were intimidating the, the Muslims who were eating and going by the break hall food stand and stopping them from eating or intimidating them into praying. Or we noticed one girl, for instance, who never wore a hijab before, who was suddenly wearing one. So the place became, the culture of the place changed very quickly within days um, from being this lovely, happy place into one which was quite aggressive and intimidating and where Muslim children were being intimidated into doing things they didn't necessarily want to do. And where did that energy come from? That's really what I'm interested in. What, is it just from the children? I as, think so. As with any other topic in a, any school where it's a kind of power, yeah. interesting thing to, to happen it. when you're a kid? Or so, do you think the parents were involved? No, I don't think it was the parents involved. I think I see this all the time in schools. So it's one of the reasons why we have silent corridors. People think, why do you have to go to such an extreme? But when the the stronger kids, the more powerful kids, the cooler kids take over the corridors, the weaker ones end up being hurt by that. And it, you, the, the cooler ones end up vying for the position of uh, authority in there. They're the ones on top of the culture. And that's what was happening here. The children, some of the children were taking control of the culture. You know, one thing that it's always hard to explain to people about our school is that we control the culture. Elsewhere, people leave the culture to just happen and whatever happens, happens. Whereas we have a very distinct ethos and we know what we want. We have a vision of the happiness and joy that we want the children to feel, the security, the safety. So what case has been brought? Let's get onto that because it's connected to this prayer question and the one child or the family of that child felt that, what, it's discriminatory not to allow that child to pray or discriminatory not to have a prayer room for that child? What's the basis yeah. of the claim? They want a prayer room. And uh, as I said, that even in, in itself it doesn't make any sense because you'd need several prayer rooms. But, and I have tried to explain, But is it you know, a dis why is the it legal happen? basis of the, of the claim? Is it a Well, religious freedom, I suppose. This is why I always say that libertarians are part of the problem in the country. And what I mean by that is, if your position is, we should have just freedom to do anything we want, whenever we want, etc. cetera. Um, you see, I call myself a small C conservative. I don't call myself a libertarian. And while I obviously believe in freedom and generally speaking- The school doesn't sound very libertarian, to be fair. No, but then that's children. So there is a distinction between adults and children. And Absolutely. I think often people on the left get this the wrong way around. So what I mean by that is, they give freedom to kids, have a smartphone, Play on your Xboxes, do whatever you want. If you don't want to go to school, it's okay. If you want to chat in your lessons, it's okay. And then when it comes to adulthood, that's when they're saying, you're not allowed to say certain things, you're not allowed to do, you know, you're not allowed to question, you know, you know, express your own beliefs, etc. So they give them all the freedom when they're young, take the freedom away when they're older. It actually should be the other way around. My belief is, as I think all small C conservatives would believe, that children. You need to restrict their freedom when they are small so that later that's when they can be truly free. Because if you just let them run riot when they're little, they're not going to learn anything, they're not going to develop, they'll just be on their smartphones all day, they'll, you know, I mean, it, it, it's awful. But if you restrict their freedoms, they're not talking in the corridors, they um, need to put their hands up in lessons and they need to be polite and all these sorts of things. If, if you do that when they're young, then when they're older, that's when they'll be truly free. And I say truly free because freedom isn't just doing whatever you want. It's having the skills and the knowledge to be able to live a free life. You know. So there's been a two or three day hearing at the High Court yeah. this week. Yeah. Uh, the, hearing, the hearing is over. The judge, the High Court judge, will at some point come back with a verdict. And what are the options there? Either you will be compelled to create a prayer room and allow prayer, or you'll be a allowed to carry on without a prayer room and not allowing prayer. Yeah. Uh, Are they the two options? 
Yeah, I suppose. I don't know. I, I, it, lawyers were saying there were various different options of what would happen. To be honest, I'm not entirely sure <laughs> what they are. Um, and, and obviously, we, if we were to lose, we could appeal. So there is that option. Does it threaten the school more generally, do you think? I mean, if you were to lose, what would the outcome be? Well, as I've said, we can't do what they're asking us to do. I mean, it is physically impossible. I'm not making that up. I mean, it, it's physically impossible while hanging on to our ethos. So we could become a normal school. We could stop being the strictest school in Britain. We could allow kids to talk in the corridors. We could allow kids just to have lunch however which way they want. We could remove the family lunch version of them serving each other and all of that. We could have the kids carry their bags with them instead of having them in the classrooms. So do you feel it is a campaign against the ethos? That's really the question. Is it, is it what it purports to be, which is one child or the family of one child upset that they're not able to pray regularly during the day? Or do you feel like it is part of a broader campaign of people who don't like the way you're running your school? There are a lot of people who don't like the way we run our school, but I don't think that this is a campaign on that. I think that people don't understand our school. And unless you visit it and really spend the day looking at how things work and so on, it's very hard to understand what I'm saying. So they say things like, it's only five minutes at lunch. Why don't you just let them pray? It's no big deal. But they don't understand what we're doing in terms of socializing the children, bridging the divide between races and religions. They say the same thing about silent corridors. What's the big deal? Just let them chat in the corridors. But they don't understand what we are doing. The, the reason why our children are what they are, which is so polite and lovely and kind and happy and so on, is because of the things that we do. But people don't get that. So I think even the girl in question, she's there, but she doesn't realize. She imagines that... You could still have Michaela the way that it is, but just have a few prayer rooms. To some listeners, I think it might be surprising that this case has even got that far. I mean, why are we funding a case all the way up to the High Court and potentially beyond for someone to try to make this change? Could they not just withdraw from the school and go somewhere else if they don't like how it's run? I mean, why well, is the case even happening? And it's also the case that, of course, you know, we do, we are very clear with the families beforehand that we don't have a prayer room. But that's not up to me. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, uh, you know, if if legal aid is such that they decide to fund these kinds of cases, then that's the way that it is. So you're sounding to me quite forgiving here. I could imagine it feels quite an onslaught that government money, legal aid, there's a lot of lobby groups that don't like you and don't like the way you're running your school. You don't see any kind of dark forces abroad that are rain, arraigned against you that uh, keep you up at night. You you just think... Well, there are lots of dark forces against us. <laughs> I'm sort of used to it. Look, the people who hate our discipline, for instance, and the silent corridors, etc., my position there has always been, well, look, if you don't like it, you don't have to send your children here. My position is the same with prayer. You, you, you know, we are a very particular kind of school. And if you don't want that, then you don't have to have it. They are objecting to say, but this is what we want and this is what we should have. Do you think it's changed over the past few years then? You, you mentioned that it was never a problem from 2014 onwards. Mm. It's only become an issue recently. Do you think what you're seeing in your school is a sort of microcosm of the broader culture Maybe. war in a sense? And these questions of ethnicity and religion have become more prominent in recent years? Maybe, but I would stress that all of our families of different religions make sacrifices, including our Muslim families. This is one family that we're talking about that's taken us to court. No so support many of our, from other families as far as you well, know? Well, I don't know. There may be a few. I don't know. I have to say that our Muslim families are so supportive and lovely. Um, my, my head of year eight was just saying to me yesterday how since all of this has happened, he's had seven or eight meetings with various different Muslim families about their children. Not one of them has mentioned the case or the negativity in the press or anything. You know, they just love the school and they love the fact that their children are doing so well. So that, that's the Muslim families. But there's also the Jehovah Witness families who don't like the fact that we teach Macbeth as a set text at GCSE because there are witches in it. And this goes against their religion. Um, but they put up with it. We've got Christian families who have complained about um, our revision sessions for GCSC exams uh, happening on a Sunday, but they just put up with it. Um, we've got Hindu families who have complained about eggs uh, touching the plates that they eat on and they want separate plates. And we say no. And they say, OK. You know, the fact is, for a multicultural, multi-faith society to succeed, everyone needs to make sacrifices. The examples you just listed are really interesting. 
but it does feel like these kind of complaints come disproportionately from the Muslim community. Mm -hmm. Is that if we're being frank, mm. that is the reality, isn't mm -hmm. it? So their perception is that your prayer ban is specifically targeting Muslims because they're the ones who are asking for it. And a lot of these culture war issues are coming from that community. Do you think that's fair? I do think it's fair what you say. Having said that, I would defend so many of our Muslim families because they are making those sacrifices just like everyone else is making those sacrifices. And they love the school and they're so happy with it. All of our schools, all of our institutions and so on need to understand that for multiculturalism to succeed, we need to have an active role in making sure that we are succeeding with it instead of just allowing things to go free. That's where I'm more critical of the libertarian mindset. Um, and and especially when it comes to children. So back, smartphones, for instance. I don't think children should have them in schools. I don't think they should have them at all. One thing we strongly encourage our families to do is not give your child a smartphone. Now, some people will say, taking away their liberty. Yeah, I am. I take away the liberty on everything. <laughs> well, I say that. They don't, they don't get liberty until they're adults and have responsibilities alongside That's them. right. And I would just say as well, children don't have sex. They don't get married. They don't drive cars. They don't smoke. They don't drink alcohol. They don't watch porn. You know, there's a million things that we stop children from doing. So I just think there should be more things that we should stop children from doing. And to be honest, 50, 60 years ago, we did stop children from doing more things. It's just that it was understood that schools needed to be ordered places with, 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 uh, with spaces that were silent and so on and so forth. And I say that gets more and more difficult the more multicultural your community. So it's really interesting when you look at Progress 8 and you look at the, uh, if you look at all the schools that did really well on Progress 8, look at the top 20 schools uh, from last year. The vast majority are of a particular religion right? They'll be Muslim, they'll be Jewish, they'll be Christian. <laughs> you know, they are of a particular religion. In other words, the schools have a more homogenous culture. Exactly, exactly. And when you have a more multicultural community, you have to actively act in order to ensure that that works, not just in terms of grades, but also the, the socialization, the happiness, the ability for children to be friends across races and religions. In a way, and this is the kind of heart of it, isn't it? Whether a multicultural society can work or not. In a way, what you're saying is the opposite of a multicultural vision. You're saying that a truly multicultural society can't work. We need to have a monocultural society to some degree in order to bring people together and in different cultures need to be secondary to that. Is, is, so really, are you a multiculturalist at all? Well, it's like you say, to some degree. So we're all under the umbrella of being British and we very much buy into that. And we want our children to feel British. One of the things that makes me so annoyed about what some of the people on the left say is that well, no, you're not British, actually. You're Jamaican or you're Ghanaian and so on. And I think, no, we brown and black people have just as much right to call ourselves British as white people do. And so we're all British together. But it's still the case that our children, well, you know, they have they eat different foods at home. They have different religions. Um, they have different ways of dress when they're outside of the school. So they do have some different cultures. But we allow that multiculturalism to happen underneath this umbrella of Britishness and we ask them to sacrifice on some of those cultural issues that might threaten the happiness of the whole. And given our building and given our ethos of not splitting children between, you know, uh, between races and religions, it therefore means it's incumbent on all of us to make those sacrifices. So do you see your school in a way as a bit of a microcosm of the wider country? And that those same principles is how we should deal with multicultural tensions more generally? Do you yeah, think we I do should think... be? We need a, a Michaela type approach to the country. Is that, would you go so far as to say that? Well, I would say, obviously, there are different buildings and there are different, you know, head teachers who want to run things differently. I understand that. So I'm not saying everyone shouldn't have a prayer room necessarily. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that if the thing that the different cultures in the school, the different races and religions, if what they're asking for is something that would divide them, then you should reconsider it. Final question for you. Do you feel optimistic? You're being put in the dock, literally, on this question. Do you feel that your vision is going to survive, is going to 
carry forth for years to come, or do you think it could be defeated? I've been saying these things for many years, as you'll know. <laughs> I've been shouting about the importance of schools. Like the key thing here is no one, either on the left or the right, understands the importance of schools. Both sides want a particular kind of society and so on. Nobody seems to understand that our adults go through the school system first and that the schools form, they partly form who those children are going to be, right? And the, 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 the influence of teachers and schools is huge. And so if we just let the schools run like that, well, you'll end up with chaos in the end. There ought to be a vision for the country's schools. <laughs> there ought to be something that, things that we all agree on. And so when I'm talking about this multiculturalism point, um, look, we are a multicultural country and we want that country to succeed. And I know many people on the right will say, well, this is ridiculous. We've let too many of them in or whatever. Well, okay, you know, you can say that, but we are where we are, you know, we're here. So we, we need to make it work. And how are we going to make it work? Well, one way in making it work is by uh, enabling schools to actively encourage a successful multicultural environment. And that needs uh, the laws supporting us. That needs our public culture to support us, the media to support us. I've been fighting with the media for, for over a decade, you know, with the things that I say and the things that I do. And, um, and all I've ever been doing is turning up every morning at 6.45 at school every day to, to, to make a school that it, extraordinary. But I get a lot of criticism, a lot of it. And not just over the prayer thing, over everything I do, whether that's silent corridors or teachers leading the learning, adult authority in the classroom. So you're not quitting anytime soon? No, I'm not quitting. I hope people will listen. Um, I hope I hope people on both sides of the political divide will see just how important schools are and just how important it is for us all to embrace uh, a different way of making multiculturalism succeed. Catherine Burble-Singh, thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. That was Catherine Burble-Singh, Britain's strictest headmistress. She is being literally taken to court over her school rules, which do not allow prayer during the day and do not have a prayer room to facilitate it. It feels like a bit of a test of this government, of this judiciary, and how the big questions of a multicultural society are going to play out. We'll be watching it closely. Thanks for tuning in. This was Unheard.